It's 1989, the year the Berlin Wall was falling. Maggie Thatcher was Prime Minister, just about. Everyone's favourite soap star was taking the UK charts by storm and I was a producer on a little TV show called Top Gear. While I was there, I recruited a chap called Jeremy Clarkson. No idea what happened to him. More importantly, Georgie Barrett came into the world. And what about the tech? Well, this was an era when gaming really came to the fore, starting with this, the Sega Mega Drive. By the time production ceased five years later, Sega had sold 30 million of them, and players had a library of over 900 games to choose from. But arch-rivals Nintendo fought back in the shape of this, a handheld console called the Game Boy. The dot matrix display looks dated now, but no one knew any better back then. Thanks to its iconic design and excellent battery life, the Game Boy was an instant and enduring hit. Together with its successor, the Game Boy Color, production continued for 14 years, and Nintendo shifted 118 million of them. <laughs> And the gaming kept coming, because 89 also saw the creation of SimCity. SimCity was the first ever simulation game which allowed players to create their own worlds. Building and managing your own city proved extremely popular, and various incarnations of the game would go on to reach worldwide sales of an estimated $5 billion. A single-player game, it was particularly unusual in that you can't really win. And it doesn't really end. And 1989 also gave us the creative Sound Blaster card. Sounds a PC could make went from this... ..to this. Not surprisingly, it rapidly became the best-selling expansion card, as owners rushed to give their personal computers a proper voice. But other developments in the world of personal computing weren't so successful. Take Apple's first bash at a battery-powered computer. It was called the Macintosh Portable, though the portable bit was rather debatable. Apple was so intent on giving it decent standalone power, they equipped it with a monstrous battery. Yes, it could keep going for 10 hours on a single charge, but it was four inches thick and weighed seven kilos. And the cost was also hefty, around five grand. That's 11,000 quid in today's money. Not surprisingly, it was ditched two years after launch. And then there's the power glove. Mm, another slight disappointment. <laughs> It was made by Mattel as an accessory to Nintendo's entertainment system, allowing you to remotely move on-screen characters in specially designed games using virtual reality mechanics. Power blown. Everything else is child's play. It was designed in just eight weeks and it shows the glove was roundly criticised for its lack of accuracy and its awkward controls. But from my point of view, I've saved the best till last because it involves photography. 1989 saw the release of the first ever commercially available portable digital cameras. To be honest, none of them were very good because the sensors offered very low resolution, just 0.4 of a megapixel on average. Mm. And the Fujix DSX, which is generally thought to be the very first of these cameras, was rather mm. dear at $20,000. Not surprisingly, there's no evidence that Fujix actually sold any of these cameras. But that's not really the point, because without pioneers like them, we wouldn't have devices like these. 